Well, today at Google, we're delighted to welcome Mr. Eric Malinowski. Uh, Mr. Mar Malinowski is a sports and features writer based out of the Bay Area and has written pieces for such publications as Wired, Rolling Stone, Slate, and The New Republic. Uh, he was a reporter for Bleacher Report, where he covered the Golden State Warriors. Uh, and he is also a frequent guest on NPR's Only a Game. Uh, he has been recognized three times by Best American Sports Writing, which is an annual, annually published anthology of the finest sports journalism in the US. Uh, he's here today to discuss his new book, Beta Ball, How Silicon Valley Built One of the Greatest Basketball Teams in History. Please join me in welcoming to Google, Mr. Eric Malinowski. Eric, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming. Um, so I think uh, I'd like to start with maybe a, a quick reading from the book. Sure. Uh, I think yeah. you mentioned Google once or twice. Yeah, there. there's there's a couple of Google references <laughs> sprinkled throughout the book. So we'll do a, we'll do a blind read here. And okay, we'll see. And then we'll, we'll do a, we'll do a quiz at the end. Okay. <laughs> so see if you can think about who who would be saying this quote. <clears throat> so a little backstory here. So this is the setup to Kevin Durant when he signed with the Warriors on July 4th of last year. So this is a reference to the backlash that was building up in the wake of that. Quote, nobody complains when somebody leaves Apple and goes to Google. Aren't they in competition with each other? Nobody talked junk about the CEO who leaves Apple and goes to Google. As a basketball player, you are the CEO of a business. You are a business. Kevin Durant is a big business. He is the CEO of that business. So him going to play basketball for a different team the CEO decided to leave where he was at and go somewhere else. But there's so many guys in this league that are so stupid, they don't think like that. They don't think business-wise. It happens every day in the world. But in basketball, it's a problem. Aren't you competitive in your day job if you work for Apple? Don't you want to outdo Google? What's the difference on the basketball court? It's your day job. You want to do what's better for you. OK. so. Do we think that Joe Lakeup, the owner of the Warriors, said that, who is a Silicon Valley venture capitalist for 25 years? Do we think that Rick Welts, the team president, might have said that, or Steve Kerr, the head coach of the Warriors? Or do we think perhaps that was Draymond Green who <laughs> said that? Um, obviously, just the fact that we're asking this question, it was Draymond Green who said that. Um, but I like that quote. And that's a quote, obviously, that pops up at the end of the book, because the book is written sort of chronologically, and that's a recent event. But I like that because it serves as a nice bookend to kind of what you've read throughout the book to that point, uh, which is that uh, the Warriors are, there are a different kind of organization. And the players and the executives in the front office here, they, uh, they think and they talk in a different kind of way. And they approach not just the game in another way, but sort of the fundamentals of the sport and the way that they approach free agency and their image and all those other sort of extracurriculars. They look at the whole package. Uh, and they, they approach it in a different way that I don't think you get to see in a lot of organi other organizations. And that's, that's a representative of what they've spent years uh, trying to build up the culture here with the Warriors. Mm -hmm. And I think you mentioned throughout the book sort of parallels with, with sort of the Silicon Valley ethos and, right. and the culture of the team. And I think there's a lot of parallels with Google as well. Right. Yeah. It's about, um, you know, it's about, uh, it's about empowering your employees. It's about, um, it's really one of the major themes of the book is this idea that you never really know where the next good idea is going to come from. Um, you know, you might have a lot of different people in the room, um, you know, different pay grades. Maybe some people's office has a window. Maybe some don't. Um, but you know, you don't. Um, but you don't necessarily feel intimidated. You understand that you're all there, um, invested in a common problem, and the bottom line is you're all there to solve it. And so um, you know, someone might have a good idea. They might feel empowered to, to bring that up. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is that there's not a lot of organizations in the NBA that, uh, that embrace that sort of philosophy. And that was something that uh, when the new ownership came in in the summer of 2010, they realized that um, you know, we, we don't uh, have a whole lot to lose basketball-wise. And so they had a lot to lose financially because they had paid a record uh, sum of money. They had paid 450 million dollars, which was, you know, even though we just had the Houston Rockets sell for 2.2 billion, uh, 450, that was, that was a record sum, even though it was only seven years ago. So they came in and they realized maybe financially we have a lot to lose, but basketball-wise, we have an opportunity to, you know, basically strip this organization down to its bare bones 
and we're going to rebuild it and we're going to operate it sort of as if you would a Silicon Valley startup and we're going to imbue it with some of those same philosophies and principles uh, basically that Joe Lacob you know, helped do in his you know, quarter century working in the Valley. Mm -hmm. Okay, well that's a perfect segue then. So let's talk about where the idea of beta ball originated and could you explain maybe for people for the audience who don't know uh, the title sure. and, and sort of the, the problem. So, you know, obviously it's a direct reference to uh, that, that stage of software development called beta where, you know, your, your, your final product is not, you know, fully baked yet and so you are in a position where you can still innovate, you can still uh, change some things up, you can still, you're, you're basically not afraid to fail, uh, you shouldn't be afraid to take risks, um, there could be a big payoff in the end for you. And so, um, and so this was, you know, when I started writing the proposal about, you know, about a year and a half ago, maybe 20 months ago, this was a case where I was trying to take sort of a very macro overview and look at not just uh, what the Warriors had accomplished. I mean, that was something I wanted to get into the book, but I wanted to get into this larger question of how they were able to accomplish this thing that, uh, you know, not, not just that not a lot of organ other organizations can reach this level of success, but the fact that we were seeing unprecedented levels of success. You know, we've seen historically great teams, but you know, the Warriors have literally been doing things that we've never seen before in, in not just the modern NBA, but in the entire NBA's history. So, uh, and then it was, uh, the real brainstorm came, I, you know, uh, Peter Guber was giving a, a, a lecture down, down at Stanford. They have their sports innovation conference every March. And he said something effective, you know, we, we are operating in a constant state of beta. And, you know, I, I sort of had all of these ideas, you know, kicking around my brain at that point. And that was, and I realized that that really was sort of the connective tissue here was that, you know, they, they've, been, they've been in a position where they have, you know, they've tried to stay nimble over the years. They've, they've made decisions that have been controversial. They, uh, they've made a lot of mistakes, they, but they were um, in a position where they were going to learn from them pretty quickly. Um, but at the same time, you know, they saw that this was also, in a sense, a kind of market inefficiency that they could exploit, that, that you know, no other NBA teams were really being run like this. There were teams that had sort of embraced technology and science to, to a point but they were going to go all out and they were going to, you know, basically rebuild the entire organization with these sort of principles in mind. It was sort of a case study. Um, and if they failed, in some ways they were going to fail spectacularly. Um, but they were, th this was something that they set out to do and they were determined to see it through its end. They thought they would be successful. I, I don't think anybody reasonably thought that they would, you know, turn it, not just turn it around in five years, but create a championship winning team, uh, create something that was going to compete for championships year in and year out. Um, but you know, obviously they've had some good fortune and some, some serendipity over the years, but at the same time, they've also done a good job of putting themselves in a position to embrace that and to you know, use, take that to its, sort of its, its fullest potential. And, and that is a direct result of, of the, you know, the principles and the decisions that they've instituted over the years. So that's a lot of sort of what I get into the book, not just the basketball sense, but seeing how a lot of the off-court stuff has affected the basketball side. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like in the book, um, for as nimble as they are, mm -hmm. um, Joe Lacob in the beginning said he didn't want to come in and make any changes that were too right. drastic. Right. So it sounds like in addition to sort of being in this continuous beta stage, mm -hmm. he also kind of brings a sort of wiser business, right. you know, yeah. um, I guess, experience to the, yeah. to the team. Do you, do you have anything yeah, to say? Yeah, I mean, this was, um, you know, this is something that with sports fans, you know, you have to understand that the Warriors were a historically dreadful team. Like, I mean, really, really bad. They had, um, by the, when the new ownership came in, they had not made the playoffs in um, 16 out of 17 years preceding that. And it's really hard to not make the playoffs in the NBA. Like, literally a majority mm -hmm. of the teams in each conference make the playoffs every year. Right. So it almost requires a, a certain perverse kind of effort to, to be that bad <laughs> in some ways, or it's just an extraordinarily amount of bad luck or incompetence. And I think it was all of those things for the Warriors. Mm -hmm. um, but when they, uh, yeah, but when, when, when the new ownership came in, they, they decided that, yeah, they were, um, they were gonna do it their way, but they, they, they made a lot of mistakes, you know, those first couple years. They, uh, you know, they, they had a lot to, to dig out from, but um, there was, you know, there was, there, there, the, there was a little bit of a fan revolt there at a couple of times along the way. So they, uh, they, they, they were um, not stubborn, but they were determined uh, to, to see it through to a certain point. But 
yeah, they were, um, they decided that we're just gonna try to put ourselves in the best position to try to succeed. And, and there were times along the way where they didn't know which direction it was gonna go in. And, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a foregone conclusion at any point that they were gonna succeed to this level, but um, they kept at it and they had some good fortune along the way, but they also had the opportunity to embrace all of that. Mm -hmm. I wanna dive in a little deeper mm -hmm. uh, to what you mean when you say that it was Silicon Valley and science mm -hmm. uh, that built this team. Yeah, it was, um, you know, they, so I mean, I'll, 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 as a way of going into that, I'll say my reporting on the Warriors goes back. You know, I've gotten to cover this team pretty closely the last um, three years or so, but my reporting really starts with them back in the spring of 2011 when the new owners had just come in. They had just been approved in November of 2010, so they were, you know, about three or four months basically on the job. And, uh, and I did a story for, for Wired um, about how they were, you know, one of the first few teams in the league to adopt these, uh, to install these motion tracking cameras that, you know, we know in the NBA today as sport view, and, you know, has, has pretty much changed the way that we, you know, we write about basketball, that we, we understand the game, all sorts of things that, you know, we never thought would be uh, quantifiable before. And, um, but back then, you know, it was this very nascent technology, it was, uh, it was very new, and so I think the analytically driven teams you know, such as, uh, such as the Houston Rockets, who are led by Daryl Morey, an MIT grad, the co-founder of the Sloan Sports Conference. San Antonio Spurs have always been analytically driven. Oklahoma City Thunder and, uh, you know, the Dallas Mavericks, you know, with Mark Cuban and everything. Th those are teams that were the first signatories on that, and they always, uh, so those were the teams you would expect. The Warriors were the fifth team to adopt Sportview, and I, when I read about that, or I remember about it in the newspaper, I was really surprised because that was just not something that you associated with this team, but it was a very clear, idea, it was a very clear indication that they were embracing, um, that they were embracing the geography, that they were embracing the fact that uh, Silicon Valley was in their backyard, that I, it was very obvious, you could see then that Joe Lake was going to, you know, use his roots as a venture capitalist and try to, you know, learn from, from what he had learned from 25 years, you know, being around these sorts of companies and, you know, the people working on Sportview were, you know, it was all right here, it was very local. So, um, so I wrote that story, and you know the basic premise was that maybe they're going to turn this around. Maybe it's going to give them a chance to, you know, maybe become a me mediocre team. Maybe they can get out of the the, the bottom of the NBA. Um, and that was part of it, but it was also this idea that we're going to hire the right people. We're going to bring in people that uh, have sort of a different kind of experience uh, and a different background. You know, I look at someone like, uh, for example, hiring Bob Myers as assistant general manager. This was also Literally the day that I visited Oracle Arena to see the cameras and, you know, was walking on the catwalks, you know, 80 feet above the court, right. it was later that day that news had leaked that they were hiring uh, a player agent uh, named Bob Myers to, to work in their front office and basically to groom this guy to be the next general manager. And there were a lot of people around the NBA that scoffed at this idea and they thought, well, he doesn't have the right kind of experience. He's never worked in a front office. And the Warriors looked at that and they, they sort of, their thinking was a little more lateral and they thought, well, 15 years of experience at the negotiating table, that's 15 years of experience at the negotiating table. Sure, maybe he's on the other side of the table, but it's all this, it's, in some sense, it's all of the same thing. And maybe this is something that other people are not appreciating or they're overlooking. He, this is a guy who knows the agents having worked alongside them. He knows the players having literally represented them. You know, this is a guy that, he, this is a new kind of NBA executive. So is that sort of lateral thinking and thinking, you know, this is a guy who has maybe a different set of core strengths, and we, we need to bring this guy on our team. And so, you know, bringing him in, and, you know, he, he was the guy who, you know, signed Andre Iguodala. It was literally through his sheer efforts. And I would say not, not by having to convince Andre Iguodala to come to the Warriors. He wanted to come here. But Bob Myers had to dump $24 million in contracts. And so, who, in some ways, who better to do that than a former player agent who understands the collective bargaining agreement, who understands the intricacies of, of contracts and who knows the teams out there who would be willing, who have the right, the, the executives in place would be willing to take on those contracts. So, and, and then you, even just to the present day, you look at, you know, signing Kevin Durant, it was through Bob, you know, it was through his connections and through his, just his sheer energy and force of will uh, that allowed that to happen. So, you know, there's not a lot of organizations that would brought in a guy like Bob Myers. Yeah, they would, a lot would have wanted to bring in a guy like Jerry West, who the Warriors did and things like that, but, mm -hmm. I sort of look specifically at a hire like Bob Myers, and I think that is, that is a thing that is indicative of a specific kind of mindset. And so, you know, this idea that you're going to, you've got, um, you know, weaknesses on your team and strengths, and you're not going to bring in just basically the most talented, the most experienced, 
but you're going to bring in people who have a specific kind of experience and you're going to use their strengths to you know, uh, make up for the weaknesses perhaps of other people on the team. And I think that is sort of a very sort of Silicon Valley mindset where you're, you wanna bring in people who have all these varied experiences and you, you want this to be this sort of perfect little brew where you know, everyone is sort of working in concert and people are lifting each other up and, and all this sort of thing. And, mm -hmm. and this, is, this, is just, this is a thing that has sort of been anathema to, you know, to NBA front offices over the years, but the Warriors figured that this was something that we can apply to running a basketball team. Mm -hmm. The idea of building, bringing together an eclectic board right. who, can, who can bring, val bring yeah. value in different ways. Yeah. Um, and also, I think it's kind of a Silicon Valley idea. Um, you said that they were the fifth Mm -hmm. uh, team to, to use data science, but right. you say throughout the book how they weren't really looking for a short-term payoff with it, that right. they knew it wasn't going to pay off for a long time, yet they yeah. continued to make the investment. Yeah, I mean, uh, they were, you know, what they were doing was so new and so nascent at that point, and the technology itself was, was so immature in some ways that they had the presence of mind that they were going to spend a not insignificant amount of money, you know, installing these cameras, and then in, in time, hiring people to interpret this data uh, in such a way that would you know, befit the basketball team. But, but all of that took a long time. And at the very beginning, they did not have a head coach in place, uh, Keith Smart, who was very receptive to all of that. Um, in fairness, not even the next head coach they hired, Mark Jackson, was all that receptive <laughs> to it of it. But by that time, they uh, were in a position where they were hiring you know, the, these analysts. They were bringing people into their front office um, that could interpret the data in such a way. And I should say also that, you know, this was really only, you know, six years ago, we're basically talking about, there actually, I mean, there just weren't even a lot of people in the industry that, you know, were well-versed in this sort of thing. You know, they had to, they had to sort of look at who were the people that, um, that were gonna be up and coming in this industry. Mm -hmm. the, who are the people that might be a general manager in 10 years, but, you know, they're, they're taking sort of a different um, career path. You know, it's very much something like, you know, in Moneyball, when Michael Lewis, you know, he talks about, you know, obviously Moneyball is all about Billy Bean, but, you know, one of the, the secondary stars of that book is Paul DePodesta. And so basically what the Warriors were doing is, who is our Paul DePodesta? Who are the people that are, you know, younger but are coming up and are, are native in this sort of language and, and, and these sorts of skills? And so it was about, you know, they, they were in a position where, you know, Joe Lacob's son, Kirk Lacob, you know, was a Stanford graduate and he was, He's actually friends with a lot. You know, it's going to be these guys that are you know working on these sort of you know these tech uh, initiatives that you know could be applied to basketball in a certain way. And so, in some ways, they were fortunate you know to have Kirk Lake up in a position where he can you know bring in some of these guys and introduce them to the team. But you know, it's also about hiring a guy like Sammy Gelfand, you know, who came up, you know, he was a DC guy and you know came up through the D League and was working as an analyst. And you know, this was a guy you know as you read in the book, you know, Kirk Lake and Sammy Gelfand, you know, they, they basically formed this this bond, this friendship. And you know, Sammy is. One of these guys now that comes up, and you know now to this day, you know he's he's the number two guy um, at the Warriors and in the analytics department. But you know this is a guy who was hired in a lot of ways, not just to crunch numbers, but to be that liaison, to be that guy who can can act as a go between uh, between uh, the analyst, uh, you know, the analytics department and the coaching staff, and and then in in turn the players because the Warriors realized early on even if they were aggregating all this data, even if they didn't necessarily know when they were gonna be able to use it in a basketball kind of way, that when it came time to do that, that you could have the best analytics in the world. But if you don't have people in place who are going to, uh, that can convey that information in a way that makes sense, that can apply that in a basketball sense, and go to these coaches and go to these players and say, look, I know that you're used to doing things in a certain way, but this, you know, go work with us on this. Like, this is gonna help you play basketball uh, in a way that maybe you've never played it before. This is gonna help you find a level of success that you've never found before. Um, then the best analytics don't mean anything. If you don't have the people that can explain those concepts and, and actually will work to convince people of their, of their value, then it's almost all for nothing. So mm -hmm. it, was all, it was really just about all of these pieces coming together. And, and like you said, the investment in time, not just the money, but in time and to know that there would come a day, and maybe it was in two years or three years or four years, but that all of this stuff was, in a sense, going to pay off. And maybe it was going to pay off big time, maybe a little bit, but, but to stay with that investment and to understand that this is working towards something bigger and better in time. And it sounds like Steve Kerr is a perfect example of that, like yeah. in terms of right. no, understanding the analytics, but also knowing how to get stuff right. done. But mm -hmm. let's, let's postpone that for a second. Sure. Okay. Um, so take us back through the history for anyone mm -hmm. in the audience who may not be 
a Warriors fan, didn't right. experience it as a fan. What was the story of the Warriors before it got sold to the to the current ownership? Group? I mean, it's it's been it is it is a varied and eclectic history. They are, I mean, they are not just uh, one of the oldest teams in the NBA. I mean, the Warriors actually predate the NBA. You know, they were one of the teams. They were one of the franchises that you know merged with another league and and essentially created the NBA in, in 1949, I believe. But you know, they um, they found a lot of success early on. You know, they've had historically great players like Wilt Chamberlain and Nate Thurman and Rick Barry over the years. And, you know, they, they, were, they were really good in the mid-70s, uh, also sort of the time that the Oakland A's were winning World Series, you know, across, across the, the, the walkway from them. You know, the Warriors were winning championships in, in Oakland Arena. But uh, this was a team that, you know, when they head into the 80s and early 90s, they were, you know, success was, was few and far between. This was uh, a team that in time became historically bad um, on a level that we've almost never seen before. You know, a lot of that had to do with uh, the new owner, uh, Chris Cohan, coming in in 1995. You know, he had been a minority owner with the Warriors. He had come into the Warriors and s some, some little bit of shady means. And then even shadier means, you know, managed to become the, the full 100% owner of the Warriors in 1995. But, you know, this was a guy that was, you know, so incredibly incompetent. You know, he was a cable TV magnate. You know, he had founded and run uh, Sonic Communications, uh, mm -hmm. but he was not a basketball guy. You know, he brought in, you know, guys to run the team that were not basketball guys. You know, they were just you know guys that he had known through his you know college connections down in San Luis Obispo, um, and so it, it's no surprise that you know just year after year they would you know pass on. You, I spell this out in the book, but they passed on just one Hall of Famer after another. Mm -hmm. Obviously, hindsight's twenty twenty, but you would think at some point you would you would hit on one of these yeah. guys. But, uh, you know, obviously, I think the big one is, you know, uh, drafting Todd Fuller, you know, instead of Kobe Bryant, right. I think is sort of the one that, you know, most, uh, you know, most Warriors fans bemoan the most. But, you know, it, they would have these blips of success over the years. They had, you know, for example, the We Believe season in 2006 and 7. Mm -hmm. uh, but just as fast as that success came around, it would, it would sort of go away and it was so fleeting. So, you know, by the time the team, you know, by the time uh, uh, Cohan decided to sell the team, I mean, at that point, it almost didn't even matter who they were sold to. Mm -hmm. uh, they were going to, you know, Warriors fans were going to be elated. But, you know, you talked earlier about, you know, sort of waiting a little while to turn the team around. That was one of the reasons why the fans, uh, the honeymoon period with, with this new ownership group was so quick because they do expect, especially when you've had 15 years of, of failure, almost, almost concurrently, but this idea that you're going to clean house. You know, you're going to, it doesn't matter who you bring in, but you're going to get rid of these, all these guys that, that, that you know, had all this failure. And they didn't do that. They waited six months. They, 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 they brought a, a startup kind of mindset where it's like, we're going to evaluate everyone's place in this company, and maybe there's some hidden gems here. We don't know that. If we just come in here and clean house uh, and act uh, sort of irrationally, you could say, uh, we might be throwing out some people that could be some valued members. It, just, it doesn't mean everyone's bad. Uh, it mean, just means that a lot of them are bad, but we need to take the time and we need to invest in the in sort of evaluation process. And there were guys. There were there were holdovers. You know, there was a guy. You know, they just the Atlanta Hawks just hired a guy named Travis Schlenk. He was actually the guy that I went up in the catwalks over Oracle Arena with mm -hmm. back in 2011. But you know, he had been with the Warriors. He was a coach and then an executive. But he had been in the Chris Cohan era for you know six, seven, eight years. And he was a guy that they kept around because they looked at his place and they saw he had a specific set of skills. He was a guy that was well versed in the draft and player evaluation. And it wasn't his fault that they weren't drafting Kobe Bryant and you know Vince Carter and all these other guys, but this was a guy that we need to stick around. And so, and so they did that. It was pretty methodical, um, but they took their time. And in addition to trying to change the culture, it was about identifying who do they already have around here. Mm -hmm. um, and so that gave them a little bit of a head start. But you know, obviously, they still had all of this work to do going forward. Mm -hmm. It sounded a little bit like the movie Office Space, where they yes. bring in the consulting firm to like allow, yeah. give everyone the chance to yeah, show so their was, worth. I before. think it was a little bit of that. It was a little, little more high mind. I mean, you know, in addition to all that, they also spent you know almost two million dollars uh, renovating the, the actual offices of the Warriors. You know, they walked in there and they realized that not only is this like uh, you know this, this culture of failure, it's not just on the basketball court; it's in the workplace. And so they realized that people did not enjoy coming to work. Every day, they didn't have pride in the team. It's one of the things I say in the book: is that if they're going to sell the Warriors as this free agent destination to sell it to other players in the NBA, they basically had to sell the Warriors to their own employees first. Like that, just that that pride in the work that they were doing was just basically non-existent. So you know, they they you know knocked down cubicle walls and you know they built you know these new workspaces you know to try to 
you know, increase co cross collaboration and, and trust with each other and, and, and not just bring in the right people, but to just change the culture and change the workspace and things like that. And that's what I've seen, you know, you know, really take root over the years is that, especially with the players that they've brought in, but also talking to front office execs, but especially with the players, it's this idea that they use language that I've never heard other professional athletes use before. Hmm. They say things like, I like, I like coming to work, like coming into work today. You know, I like, you know, this, this is my job. You know, I like, I like my job. Um, and this is, this is not something that we, I think, associate with professional athletes, but just, just to sort of hear the way that they like. And I think, obviously, some of this is all the success they have. And, you know, obviously, the more success you have, uh, the, the more you want to come into work, and, and whether that's sports or, mm -hmm. you know, a business or something like that. But, but this is, but this is that's, a, that's a peek into the mindset of how the Warriors operate is that that's how they view it. They don't view it as coming in to play basketball. They, come in, they view it as coming in to do a job. Right. Everyone has a job to do, and, and the court is your works, workplace, and the practice court is your workplace. And at the day is done, you go home, you, you have your, you know, you, you do non-basketball things and other things, and you come in, you do the basketball, and everything is valued. And mm -hmm. that's just not something that you see across the NBA, but it's right. something that the Warriors, they, they, they hold that, they, they hold that in high esteem. Yeah. And on the opposite end of the spectrum, I think you mentioned the Latrell Sprewell incident. <laughs> that was sort of a low point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, great. So uh, there's a lot of talk right now about how the Warriors are fundamentally changing the way the game is played. Right. What do you make of that, and how revolutionary has it really been? I mean, it's not like, you know, it's not like the Warriors are the ones that came up with the idea that oh, we should shoot a bunch of three pointers, and and this is how we're going to, you know, score our way to success. You know, there have been, you know, uh, you look at, you know, like Doug Moe's team, Denver Nuggets team of the early '80s, where they would score, you know, 120 points a game or something like that, or you look at you know Mike D'Antoni's you know sons the seven seconds or less sons you know you know Jack McCallum's famous book, um, but especially uh, you know especially this is a lot of stuff that has taken root you know Mark Jackson I think laid the foundation for a lot of this and that's something I get into the book is that you know he's a guy that came in and he gave them a lot of confidence and, and proved that you could have a, a winning formula by shooting the three ball and that this was a, a way that you could find uh, you you could basically take the team from these lower depths and and, and you know, excel into something bigger than that. But you know, when Steve Kerr came in, it was this idea that not only can we score in bunches, we can embrace the three-point shot, even in ways that you know take it. What Mark Jack was doing, it kick, kick it up a couple of notches. But but we can also play defense at the same time. And this was, you know, you look at the metrics for the last three years, especially so when, since Steve Kerr has become head coach, we've never seen a team in NBA history that has played that has had such an efficient offense, but has not sacrificed defense in such a way. And what Steve Kerr came in and was able to do is that we're, you know, he showed the guys that not, you can keep shooting threes, you can keep scoring in bunches, but if we also commit on the defensive end, your offense is going to be more efficient than it has ever been because you, you, you get stops, you get rebounds, the other team is out of position, you run the fast break, you, know, you're, you pop back out for a three, you catch guys out of position. There's all sorts of ways that you can use defense to make your offense better. And, we, and, and so you, you just look at the numbers, and we've never seen a team excel on both ends of the court the way we've seen with the Warriors. And so they're showing in a way that uh, you can, it's not just live and die by the three, but it's thrive by the three. And at the same time, if you are committed to defense in such a way, I mean, you can, you can uh, be better off for it on both ends of the court. So they value both of those things. You know, if, if for as long as Steve Kerr is the head coach, if they're ever, you know, lower than top five in defense, you know, that's a year that he's probably going to consider a failure because he just, he values both parts of that game. But, yeah, we talk about the wars, you know, doing things that no team has ever done and sort of, you know, shaking the very core of the foundations of the NBA. This is one of those examples because we've just never seen it on both ends the way we've seen it with mm -hmm. this team. Yeah, I think the quintessential example is, like, rather than drive, or rather than taking a layup, like, Steph Curry will forego a layup right. to, to take a three. Yeah. And it's actually, so what, What's informed that strategy? Was that a data analysis, or yeah, I, I just think it's um, I think it's showing the players that, uh, on some level, it's 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 pretty elementary. It just it's it's convincing them that three is worth more than two, right? So we've got that part. You know, <laughs> we've got that you know, technical math part of the equation settled. Mm -hmm. But it's the idea that you're completely capable of shooting a three-point shot, making it in any given scenario, and. Traditionally in the NBA, it's almost it's seen as hubris in some ways to right. you know to you've got the easy layup or maybe you know, you've got you know one on one matchup you, you challenge the guy at the rim and you go you take it up and you take it strong, you don't kick it out to the trailer 
for a three-pointer when, you know, there's no one within 12 feet of him, you know, and literally, you know, everyone else is trailing on the play, but this guy's wide open. But when that guy is Steph Curry or that guy is Clay Thompson and you practice that play and they can do that in rhythm, then the whole play just feels natural to them. And so you just make that a part of your offense. You make that a part of, you know, your, the culture of how you play. And then it just becomes second nature. Then it be, doesn't become this, you know, hubristic display of basketball. Then it just becomes another part of your game plan. And boy, when, when you're an opposing team and now all of a sudden that is something that you need to game plan for, now, now you have the advantage. Now you, you know, now, now you have the leg up on them because now you have to keep them honest. Now it's just not a mm -hmm. foregone conclusion that you're going to be going up strong for the layup. Now you've got to watch the trailer. You're going to kick it out to the guy, and you have to be ready for all sorts of scenarios. Right. So much more frustrating for, for the defense. N well, not for Warriors fans, but yes, it's frustrating <laughs> for the opposing defense, exactly. <laughs> Okay, uh, can you talk about Steve Kerr? Yeah. Uh, what has he meant to the team, and what could, what could all of us learn from his leadership style? I mean, it's hard. Um, it's sort of hard for me to be objective about Steve Kerr. He's, I mean, he really is sort of one of my, in all the years that I've been covering sports and writing about it, I mean, he's pretty much one of my favorite people. He's so, um, I mean, he's just a genuine guy. You know, what you see is what you get, but, you know, he's had such, um, he's had such this uh, incredible and varied uh, life experiences, you know, Coming up through Arizona, you know his his you know the very public. You know his father was a diplomat in the Middle East. His father was assassinated in 1984. You know back when he was still a freshman at Arizona, and you know he just became this you know you know national name that everybody knew about. And it was almost about that same time that he you know just really started to find himself as a basketball player, as a person, um, and just worked his way up. You know this is a guy that really had no right. You know six three, one seventy one. You know I mean. He had a little bit of the, he just didn't have, he's not what you sort of thought of as the star, you know, college basketball player, but just through this force of sheer will, confidence, cockiness, whatever you want to call it, just this exuberance, um, he was able to, he became, you know, this, this national star and, and, and worked his way basically into a 15 year NBA career that was almost one of the most inexplicable careers just in, in terms of, you know, his, his physicality and what he brought to the game. But he wrote, he came up through the NBA in college. It was literally while he was in college that the NCAA adopted the three-point shot. And so when he got to the NBA a couple years later, um, you know, th this was a time when the three-point shot was coming into vogue. It had been in the NBA for a few years at that point, but you know, finally the NBA was embracing the idea of a three-point specialist. And so you know, I think he you know, started, or he played you know, something like 900 games across his NBA career, but I think he only started like 10. You know, he was the super six-man sub, uh, but he, that was his role and he understood that. You know, he was a team player. But also at the same time, you know, he won five championships as a player. Um, on, on, a, on a Chicago Bulls team that had Michael Jordan, he hit a game-winning shot to win a championship. You know, Michael Jordan passed to Steve Kerr to win a championship. And I think that, you know, in some ways that's, that's something that, that sort of people forget about. But, you know, that's, but at the same time, you know, this is a guy that's always understood that basketball has its place. Um, I think it's probably because, you know, all the, all the personal stuff that's gone on with him, he understands that, you know, basketball, you know, this is the thing, you know, basketball is life, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, to him, basketball is very, is very much not life. You know, there's, there's so much more to basketball and all of those things need to be balanced. Um, you know, it's about, you know, it's about happiness. It's about doing what's right for you. It's about understanding that basketball has its place, but there's so much more to experience. And not to jump ahead, but I mean, I think that's why you've seen him be such a vocal, you know, critic, you know, he's been involved with this current administration, things like that. Mm -hmm. A lot of that you've seen is manifested in this idea that, that there is so much more to life than just basketball. But, mm -hmm. you know, when they hired him in the summer of 2014, this was a case where, you know, the timing was right. Um, you know, he was in a position where he had been a general manager before in the NBA. It had gone pretty wrong <laughs> with, with Phoenix. You know, they, they, they had some success, but that team, you know, it, was, it ended pretty, pretty badly. But he had been a broadcaster a couple of times, but he was in a position where his kids were older. Uh, he was looking for a new challenge. I think he'd always wanted to get into coaching, but you know, this was a guy, you know, he had had a heck of a head start. You know, the Warriors had won 51 games under Mark Jackson. Uh, and you know, there was a lot of pressure uh, coming at whoever was gonna replace him. There were a lot of very good reasons why Mark Jackson, uh, why his tenure came to an end as Warriors coach, but mm -hmm. this was a guy with the, the weight of the world on his shoulders, um, and I think there were a lot of coaches that might have come into that situation and and realized that uh, and it might have gone really badly. You know, they had all this talent, there was all these expectations. They thought maybe there was the germ of sort of a championship level team here, um, but he was he was he came in. It was a position where 
He, institute, he, had, he had some very certain ideas and things that he wanted to institute. Um, and so he just set about doing it. And it was a very, he, he fit in really perfectly, I think, with the culture that, uh, that we had seen here. But, mm -hmm. but they had some really tough decisions to make right off the bat as soon as he came in as head coach. Mm -hmm. um, one of those was this idea that, oh, whether or not they should uh, trade away Clay Thompson for Kevin Love, right? right. So this was, um, I think he'd only been on the job for about a month or so. And you know the Minnesota Timberwolves, you know, come to the Warriors, and this idea that we're going to offer Kevin Love for Clay Thompson—that was basically the centerpiece of the package. Mm -hmm. And this was something a lot of people. There were a lot of Warriors fans that thought this was kind of a no-brainer. You know, Kevin Love could shoot the three ball. Uh, he was taller. Um, you know, he wasn't—he wasn't a defensive upgrade. I think they were a little bit of a wash in that regard. But this idea that that Steve Kerr is coming in, he's going to institute this new kind of you know, motion kind of offense. You know, Mark Jackson had a very sort of traditional, you know, pick and roll offense, that kind of thing. Um, you know, s you know, script out these you know three point plays for Steph and Clay. And with Steve Kerr, it was going to be a little bit more not improvisational, but it was going to be a little bit more free flowing. It was going to be more about spacing. It was going to be more about these you know plays that were predicated on timing. And the idea was that um, somebody like Kevin Love might fit into that a little bit better. And so, um, but this was one of the big decisions they had to make. And so. It ended up, as I read in the book, that you know, they had uh, you know, had all these guys in the room trying to make the decision, trying to you know, including Joe Lacob, including you know Bob Myers and top management. And this idea that are we going to pull this trigger? And so there were a lot of people in the room that wanted wanted to make that move, but there were two voices in that room that were that were pretty staunchly against this. And one of those was Jerry West, uh, who they brought in not to be a decision maker, but to be a right. guy who could. He specifically did not want to make those decisions. He told them flat out, but he, I can point you guys in the right direction and you can value my counsel or not if you want to. And so this was a case where Jerry West was speaking up and saying, you guys, I really think you should stand pat. You should hold your ground. Uh, don't, you know, don't be enticed by, by, by the idea here. And the other guy was Steve Kerr. And he said, you know, I, I like the team that we have here. I like the players that are in here. I don't think we need to make this sort of drastic, you know, bold kind of move. Um, and it was obviously it was you know Steve and Jerry that that sort of ruled the day. You know their voices carried the most weight, they were the most persuasive, um, and you know Joe Lakeup, you know he's he's fine with that. You know I mean you know he's he's a guy I think that could have gone either way on that, but he chose to listen to these guys' counsel. Um, and I'll just read a, a little bit. Yeah. You know something from the book, something that he says, sort of, right. you know directly in relation to that. You know Lakeup says you know we encourage very strong debate, but then it's my job to make the decision. Uh, I certainly listen most of the time to what the group decides, and then we just do it and we go. I do think that that is what's different. That's what separates us. That's the Silicon Valley way, the entrepreneur way. That is not the big company way. Um, and so I think that's I think that's really sort of representative of you know in that whole anecdote, this whole idea that you know that it was would have been very easy to sort of bow to the pressure, to bow to the you know, the tantalizing idea of bringing a guy like in with Kevin Love and into this new offense. I think it helped that a lot of the, one of the guys telling them not to do it was Steve Kerr, you know, the guy who would, uh, you know, eventually have to coach him. Mm -hmm. um, but it was this idea that we're going to give everyone a voice, we're going to try to look at everything objectively, and we're just going to try to do, make the decision that's best for our team. We're not going to let any of those sort of external pressures weigh on us. We're going to try to look at it in a very sort of narrow, uh, you know, goal-oriented and driven kind of way, and uh, and again, you know, sometimes I like that anecdote because it's not about sometimes it's not about the decisions that you do make; it's about the decisions that you decide not to make. Mm -hmm. and, in, and in this very specific case, I think you know history has sort of validated their decision not to make the decision. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and yeah, at Google we have a motto having to do with hippos, like the highest right. paid person. Mm -hmm. you don't necessarily just blindly follow them, that we sort right. of weigh the ideas exactly. for their intrinsic value. So it sounds right. like you know, mm -hmm. it's a, a very similar situation. Um, so what do, um, for the people in the, like, so what do Warriors fans, like the diehards, uh -huh. they may not be season ticket holders, uh, right. but people who, who have followed the team closely, what, what can they take away from, from the book? I think just understand that, you know, we have, um, uh, so, so people that are season ticket holders or not? <laughs> no, oh, not. So they're not but, season but, ticket holders. But still, very good fans. Uh, I think that just this idea that uh, this is you know, this whole ascent has been so fast. There's there's so much that goes into it. There's so much that goes into you know building a team from scratch, basically. E even just through 
you know, like you know, this has been a pretty ephemeral amount of time. You know, we're only talking five, seven years, you know, five years of the playoffs, seven years uh, since the new ownership has come in. But I mean, there's just so much that goes into it. There's so many little decisions and machinations, and there's so many uh, parts along this path that's a lot more winding than linear. But there's so many parts where it just all could have gone terribly wrong. You know, none of this was, um, you know, this was no foregone conclusion that these guys were going to come in and they were going to, you know, institute these principles and this new philosophy and that it was going to work out like this. And at the same time, it's not just a, a, a matter of, it's not just so reductive as just saying, oh, it's just because they have a Steph Curry or a Clay Thompson. I think that's, I mean, look, I think there's, there's, val there's validity to that. I, I don't discount the, the importance of having talent. You know, obviously I think talent in some ways is the biggest part of the equation, but just the fact that we're seeing uh, a team, I mean, we've seen elite teams before in the NBA, but just that we're seeing a team now that, you know, has reached such, I mean, is literally doing things every season that we've never seen a team do before. And then also now that we're seeing teams sort of uh, copy that in such a way and trying to not just, not use that necessarily as a blueprint for, for success, but at least and then to try to put themselves in a position to take advantage of the good fortune or, you know, development curves, you know, the, the same way that the Warriors have. But just this idea that, you know, they can, you know, they can read this book and understand that it's a lot, there's a lot more complexity to it. It's a lot more nuanced. Um, obviously having a Steph and a Clay and a Draymond and a Kevin Durant, obviously that, that helps out a lot, <laughs> but there's really so much more that goes into that. And, and it really is, it's not just about what is on the court, but it's about what, what is the front office doing? What are the coaches doing? What, what, is, what is everyone in the organization doing to help everyone sort of play the best basketball they can, be the best kind of employee they can be? And I feel like on some of those, a lot of that stuff would be relatable because I think we've all, anyone's that worked in, anyone's had a job has sort of found themselves in that kind of position where you know, they, 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 wanna, they wanna be happy where they work, they wanna, they wanna thrive, they want their colleagues to help pick them up when they're down, that kind of thing. And so I feel like people read through it and it's like, yeah, I mean, I feel like they can kind of relate to a lot of that. Mm -hmm. So a lot has been made uh, of the Warriors embracing new tech and analytics to take the team to the next level. Mm -hmm. uh, but in real terms, what, is that, what does that look like? And, and how do they maintain their advantage over other teams in the league who, who are yeah. now trying to catch up? I mean, it's tough because, you know, like I said, it was, it was, easy, uh, it was easier in the beginning for them because you know, they were you know, one of the first signatories of Sport View. And so you know, it was pretty easy in some ways to see that 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 was the direction that the league was heading. So at that point, it was really just a matter of investing the money, hiring the right kind of people, and then I think in time just sort of hoping that it kind of panned out to some extent. Um, it's, become, it's become harder over the years to do that because you know, Sport View is so ubiquitous now, mm -hmm. and you know, every, every team has analysts. You know, every team uh, sends people to the Sloan Sports Conference every March in Boston. So. Uh, everyone sort of understands uh, a lot of those things. And so for the Warriors especially, trying to maintain that edge, it's about, you know, it's about, I mean, they, they've got a lot in place because they have a guy like Steve Kerr. And, they, and, and more than Steve Kerr, they have, you know, he has hired assistant coaches that really understand these things. Even here, you're talking about old, old timers like Ron Adams and, and, and people like that. They've been around a long time, but yet, you know, understand the value and the importance of those things. But for them, it's about trying to sort of find the next frontier you know, it's about, uh, it's about, you know, monitoring sleep patterns, you know, it's about, you know, issuing, you know, uh, personality tests and things like that and, and regular uh, player evaluations and not, and not judging sort of all of these things individually, but trying to look at them in their totality and, and looking at that and saying, what sort of a picture uh, of my basketball team are all of these different criteria painting and how do I apply that in a basketball sense? And so they can understand you know, when guys uh, might need a day off, you know, they might, the, the term they use is redlining, you know, are these guys, you know, getting too close to the zone where uh, they might, um, you know, they might suffer an injury, that sort of thing. I mean, that really is sort of the next, you know, and no one has really sort of, no one has really perfected that part of the puzzle yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the next frontier really is sort of like injury prevention in, mm -hmm. in whatever form that prevents itself. The worst thing, I think they've got a lot of that figured out in terms of, you know, monitoring, you know, player fatigue and energy. You, you can only, you can't do this during the games yet. And 
there's very good reasons why, and the collective bargaining agreement is, is very clear about these sorts of things, but they can monitor these guys in practice, you know, and they can look at the sport view data from the games itself, and they can understand you know, the amount of dribbles that they're taking or how fast, literally how fast they're running up and down the court. And they can look at all of these things in concert and they can say, um, you know, it's about resting these guys, it's about who do we then put in the lineup and that sort of thing. And, that's, and to some extent, that's really all you can do, but it's about how far you can drill down on that and how many different criteria you can all bring into this equation. So for them, I think it's really, the bottom line is it's all about what new information can we gather that we're not gathering and then the second step is how do we apply that in a basketball sense? And so that's why you know they're always looking to partner up with you know these new third party you know tech ventures and initiatives, and and they're always they're always willing to listen. They're always willing to have a conversation, and you know not not all of these things pan out, and they start partnerships and they end partnerships. But I, I think they they're always looking you know, again because they have the convenience, they have they have the geography on their side. And they can uh, work to take advantage of these things that I think that a lot of organi other organizations can't. So I think they're cognizant of that advantage, and I think they just figured we're just going to use this to our to our most uh, advantage. Mm -hmm. It sounds like similar uh, data is being employed uh, for injury prevention and, and other sports as well. Keith mm -hmm. Law was here recently right. and talked about the the sleeve that pitchers are using right. now in baseball. So uh, on that note. Uh, what can what can other NBA teams, uh, but also teams just in any sport, what can they take away? What can they learn from the book? I think a lot of it is, um, I, 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 again, this, this sort of sounds obvious, but it's not, you know, it's not as ubiquitous as you might think. But you know, it's really just about listening to your athletes. You know, it's about in the same place in the workplace, it's about listening to your employees and and valuing their opinion and and their um, their place in the workplace, but. It's about um, understanding what they're going through. You know, everybody, everybody's different. Everybody processes information in a certain way. Everyone, uh, you know, fatigues in a certain way in an athletic sense. But understanding that um, that you're you're really only going to be able to predict these things as well as you can talk to your athletes, that you can gain their trust, um, that you can have a dialogue about these things. Um, you know, these are you know these are things that you know the teams they thought were you know unquantifiable or they we would not be able to. You know, discern anything of any import from, but I think that we're understanding is, as these these fields get more mature and, and more is invested in them over time, that that there is a lot to learn. That the athletes themselves are really the the, the best uh, a source of this information, and and so if you can apply that in a way that works best for your team, um, yeah, I mean you could you can prevent injuries, you can improve uh, team cohesiveness. Um, you know, these are. These are hard concepts for a lot of teams to invest in because some of them are pretty nebulous, or you know, in some cases, you know, you're relying on athletes' words. You, you don't, you don't necessarily have hard data to back it up. Um, but if you can, you know, combine these things with the data that you are being that you are aggregating, I do think you get a more fuller understanding of the athlete or in some or your employee, um, and that just you can help improve your workplace in a lot of ways. I think that. Yeah, on a foundational level, there's the, a lot of these concepts are they can be applied in all sorts of ways. Mm -hmm. And taking a lesson from the Warriors, the first step might just be collecting the data and then worrying about the analysis. Yeah, worry about later it later, on. but you have to be willing to make that initial investment. That's right. that's a leap of faith. I mean, that's not something that a lot of organizations do. And I, to some extent, I understand why some would be skittish, but you have to have the foresight to see where your where your industry is going, whether that's a sport or a business or what. Um, and just sort of, in some level, take it on faith that it's going to pay off in the end. Mm -hmm. so. so covering the team for as long as you did, having mm -hmm. spent a lot of time with them, could you, could you talk a little bit about the players? They are um, agonizingly normal. <laughs> they are, for, for the amount of success that they have, you would assume that, um, you know, I mean, you could look at you know, a guy like Draymond Green and his bluster. I mean, that's just his character. I mean, that's just who he is. Um, He's not like that all the time. What's that? Controversial. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's. Uh, but that's uh, that's the role that he has to play. He understands that that's, you know, when other guys aren't going to speak up, he's going to be the guy that speaks up. So he's, you know, if there's if there's an archetype on the team, you know, that's that's the role that he plays. Um, they are, you know, they, they've again they've experienced so much success over the years, but you know, I still have these. They still are able to have these moments where. I remember, you know, one game uh, last season where the Charlotte Hornets came into town, and so uh, Steph Curry's dad, Del Curry, who played 16 years in the NBA, um, 
he was he was very much a guy like Steve Kerr, shot the three balls, mm -hmm. and was super sixth man. Um, but you know, so he he's an announcer for the Charlotte Hornets, and so there was a time after that game in the locker room where you know, and understand that the Warriors are basically you know again at the top of the NBA, rolling basically rolling to another championship, uh, their second in three years, and. And you can have a moment where Del Curry, you know, basically walks into the, the locker room. He's, he's got his backpack on, you know, he's in full dad mode. <laughs> and he walks up to Steph's locker and there's nobody standing basically within 10 feet of them and they're just having a quiet conversation. I, I couldn't tell you what they were talking about because, you know, nobody was standing close enough to listen. But to have that sort of private, sort of intimate moment with, between a father and a son uh, and just the idea that, you know, people would sort of you're in a position where that can sort of still happen with this team, you know? It's like, I feel like this team, you know, in time sort of may, I think they're well on their way to, to their pantheon in the all-time NBA and, and this conversation of the all-time great teams, but, you know, they, they still value, um, you know, a personal, uh, just, just the atmosphere and the chemistry, and to have a locker room and a clubhouse where a dad can come in and just sort of talk to his son for a few minutes, whether it doesn't matter that the son is Steph Curry, it doesn't, you know, one of the top, you know, three megastars on the planet, um, that this is an environment where that can still happen. I think that maybe in two or three years, maybe that's not, that's, that's not going to be feasible anymore. Maybe, you know, everyone's star is just going to be so much or the, the atmosphere is going to be such that, you know, we're not going to be able to see those moments anymore. But I'll say that for this moment in time, the Warriors have put themselves in a position where they can still have those moments, where they still value that sort of normalcy. Um, We'll see if that lasts another two or three years, but for now, you know that's that's indicative of where this organization is, and I think, in a lot of ways, that that works to their benefit and it explains how they've been so successful. But now they're in a position where they can keep this success going for a few more years. Mm -hmm. um, so, what was it like to cover the last three finals? The two wins, of course, but also the the tragic yeah tragic loss. Uh, up and down and up, I guess you could say. <laughs> um, well, I should say, you know, I'm not. Uh, I'm not a lifelong Warriors fan. I'm a Knicks fan, actually, for 20 years or so. So it, it, in some senses, that helped writing the first couple of chapters of the book because you know, I, had a lot, I have a lot of experience writing about you know, poorly run, inept franchises you know, with <laughs> Warriors, uh, team owners that you just wish would uh, just go away. And literally, anyone else would come in to buy the team. But um, yeah, it's, um, it, it's, been, it's been an experience you know, seeing, um, seeing the crowds and, and seeing the level of success they've had. You know, I will say that uh, right up until you know I was in Oracle Arena for that Game Seven, uh, you know that that gutting loss, you know uh, June of 2016 when they lost uh, on the Kyrie Irving three. But you know it was really weird right up until that point. For all of the failures that they had had for all those years, with this new iteration of the team, it was you just didn't think that anything bad like that was going to happen. You just didn't think that they were going to lose uh, at the moment where they could least afford to do so, um, and it happened. And it really just showed you that. No matter what level of success you have, uh, no matter what you've built up, uh, you know you're, you're just sort of privy, you know, to the, the basketball gods or a vengeful sort, and you just never know what they're going to decide on any given day, and and those sorts of things, and a historic collapse of the kind of which we've never seen before, it can happen. It doesn't matter if you won 73 wins or 73 games or not. Um, but it was fascinating then to see an organization that had been. You know, basically publicly humiliated. On, you know, I mean, they became an internet meme, basically in and of itself. You know, blowing a three-one lead. You know, this has become part of the lexicon. This has become part of the vernacular now. So, um, but to see them uh, pick themselves up from that, and of course, I think signing Kevin Durant does a lot for the healing process. But I mean, it wasn't just as simple as signing Kevin Durant. It was about, in some ways, it was almost about. You know, it, it was like you know this idea of you know steering into the skid. You know what I mean? Like. And almost in some ways embracing the failure, not, not being afraid of it, not running from it. Um, you know, you, I, I went to the Warriors at, at a very sort of delicate time in this process and told them basically that I was going to write this book on you guys and, and you can sort of be involved, you know, to, to whatever extent. You know, obviously they can make my life easier or they, may, they can make it hard. Mm -hmm. um, and they didn't make my life easy, but at the same time they didn't obstruct. And they, and they, they literally said those words, you know, we're not, we're not going to make this hard for you. And I really appreciated that because I think that sort of did come at a very sort of critical time in my reporting for the book. Um, but at the same time, they made it very clear to me that, you know, we are we, we don't want to seem like we're you know puffing our chest out in any way or taunting people. You know, or, you know now we're you know the team that's getting a book written about them that sort of thing. And this was all again all in the wake of the Kevin Durant signing. Uh, but if you fast forward a few months later, 
they're literally selling super villains t-shirts in their team store. You know, so they are embracing this persona. They are now, in fact, profiting off of this persona <laughs> in this backlash. Um, and so I think that just comes from you know taking a step back and understanding that you know this is this is the reality. This is what has this is what has befallen us, and we can we can either run from it or we can embrace it. And I think they decided that they were going to uh, they were going to embrace it. And I think. And then you saw what happened last year. They had they had some some periods of uh, of adversity. You know, Kevin Durant got you know injured pretty late in the season, sprained his knee ligament. They, you know, lost. I don't. I think it was like five out of seven games or something like that. And then they wound up winning 14 games in a row. <laughs> and then he came back at the end of the season, and we all know what happened with the playoffs. But this was a team that you know put itself in a position where we're not going to run from any sort of adversity. We're going to meet it head on. And in some ways, it. Definitely sort of helped the book become a little bit more interesting. It certainly made for a more interesting ending to it. Um, but that's, that's just who they are. And that's, that's just what I think, again, that was sort of indicative of what they've built up over the last few years here. Mm -hmm. And speaking of the playoffs, we're going we're gonna to take some audience questions in, in just another minute or so. Mm -hmm. um, but speaking of the playoffs, um, we have seen with the league um, talent has gone, you know, gotten concentrated into right. a few teams. <clears throat> Um, and you mentioned how after the lockout, there were some things done to try and address this issue. Right. Uh, yet you still see, like in the Kevin Durant uh, move to the Warriors, how it seems like this, there's still a tendency for this to happen. So mm -hmm. what's, your, what's your thought on that? Yeah, I mean, this was something that we saw with the 2011 uh, lockout, uh, which you know, some, some of the things that resulted from that were a direct uh, response to you know, LeBron James going to Miami in the summer of 2010 um, and the decision and all of that and sort of as a response to this sort of, you know, allowing teams to create super teams or whatever. And so the idea is that you're just going to try to entice them now more to, to sort of stay with their own teams. You know, you offer more years, more money, that sort of thing. Um, but with the Warriors, it was just, I mean, in some ways, you know, they were just a, a product uh, in, in a lot of ways. The, the timing was good. Their fortune was good. You know, the idea that Steph is going to have all these ankle injuries to, in such a way that it's going to depress his market value that he can sign, you know, a, a four-year, $44 million contract when, by all rights, he probably should have signed something a lot more. We saw right after he signed that contract, he, uh, you know, he sort of took his game to a new level. Um, but, you know, these were, you know, they, a lot of it was good fortune, but they also put themselves in a position to maximize their good fortune. You know, it was about, you know, it's not lucky to, uh, you know, have a guy like Draymond Green, you know, take a several million dollar haircut on his new contract extension. It's not, you know, it's not lucky to, you know, bring in a guy like Sean Livingston, who, you know, has never really played to his full potential in the NBA. I mean, there's, there's you know, Andre Iguodala did not, you know, when he signed uh, his four year deal before, it was not for below market rates. So it was just about, it was about certain pieces coming, a certain piece of the puzzle coming together at the right time. It was not, is not something that you can really legislate out of the NBA. Um, and so that's why I'm really hesitant when people say, oh, can they just read the book? And they, is this, uh, is what the Warriors done? Is it a blueprint for other teams to follow? Mm -hmm. I don't think you can. I don't think that they could, you, you can't just follow steps A through Z and say, if you do these things, this is how you build a super team. But there are, uh, there are concepts that you can apply uh, to your team to put yourself in a better position to take advantage of you know, certain moments of, of luck and good fortune and things like that. But um, yeah, that's why it was always, it was this thing where, you know, after, especially after they signed Kevin Durant, it was like, oh, we got to change something in the CBA to, to prevent this sort of thing from mm -hmm. happening. But it's not really something you can legislate out of, out of the NBA. I call it competitive imbalance. Um, but it's the idea that I, I never understood when people say, I, uh, to me it's like the larger issue is that not that the Warriors themselves are scooping up all of this talent. I think it's easy to, to look at them and say, oh, they've got these four superstars. Um, we have to institute something to, to prevent this in the future. But to me, in some ways, I would say the bigger issue is, is you have the teams right below them who already do have a lot of talent, and they're now the ones that are trying to scoop up this elite talent. And so it's not about the Warriors getting this talent. It's about a team like Houston going out, and they've already got a guy like James Harden, mm -hmm. but now they turn they, they work this mega trade and they bring in a guy like Chris Paul. Mm -hmm. And you look at that sort of in an objective way and you think there's really no sense in having, you know, a guy like James Harden and a guy like Chris Paul, 
you know, these, these high usage guys who are used to running offenses. And there's, there's almost no, like, like, and so now it just becomes a talent grab. And now it's just mm -hmm. like, in some ways, it's, it's a little bit of desperation, but you have teams saying, well, we just need to close that talent gap in any way that we can. And so you have a, guy, you have a team like Oklahoma City that goes out of its way to bring in a guy like Carmelo Anthony and to bring in a guy like Paul George who, you know, both, you know, Melo and Paul George may not be there, you know, after this year or whatever. So, so it's extremely risky on them, but mm -hmm. they're in a position where they just have to do something to try to close this talent gap. So to me, I think that's where you end up seeing more of the imbalance. It's not just with the Warriors, but all these other sort of tier one teams. They're mm -hmm. trying to compete. Maybe it's going to make things more interesting come the end of the Western Conference playoffs, but you really are diluting now all of these other teams. And so I think that whenever these sort of these, these mega super teams will play each other, I think those games will be more interesting perhaps than they've been the last one, one or two years. But I think it's going, to, it's going to make the rest of the NBA really suffer because now you've, you've diluted the rest of that talent pool. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, the James Harden, Chris Paul sounds a little bit like the Warriors, like the, the Steph Curry and, and Monte Ellis. Right, and, and exactly, yeah. exactly. I mean, that was a case where, yeah, I mean, I get to that in, in a lot of detail in the book, but yeah, that was a case where, you know, we've basically got two guys that are almost the same physically. They basically play the same position. They bring a lot of the same game. Um, but we have to decide, and in the Warriors' case there, they decided to trade the guy who was the fan favorite, mm -hmm. uh, who was the most tenured warrior. Uh, but yeah, he was the oldest player. He, but they realized that, we're going to have to take this backlash because he's he's stunting Steph's development. He's also stunting Clay Thompson's development to some extent. And you saw that you know once they traded away Monte, Clay Thompson started all those rest of the games, the rest of the season, as I say in the book. And and that was really what what brought his development on track. So mm -hmm. it wasn't even just about helping Steph; it was about helping Clay. But yeah, in some ways, it's like the reverse Monte Ellis because <laughs> now you've got guys. And so I'm. I'm I'm not the most optimistic. You know, we can look back at this in a few months and see how Houston's season turned out. And, mm -hmm. and I think in, in, in a small sample size, I think in against the Warriors, their games against them will be more competitive. But it's not just about the games against the Warriors. It's about playing a whole season. It's about creating the right kind of chemistry and coherence with your team. So in some sense, I'll really be interested to see how Houston turns out because I don't think it's a guarantee at all that, that they're going to just bring in a guy like Chris Paul and things are going to automatically improve. And, and I think that's what I saw with the Warriors over the years. It was just about, you have the money, so you're going to try to bring in the most talent, but is it the right kind of talent? And that was a mistake the Warriors made for a lot of years, uh, right up until this new ownership came in. OK. Um, I know you touched on this already, but I wanted to expand mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, the most common criticism of the Warriors is, well, you know, the only way they keep winning is, the only reason they keep winning is they have all this generational talent, mm -hmm. i.e. Steph Curry, um, mm -hmm. Kevin Durant. To that, what, what do you say? I say that's a really big part of it. And I really, <laughs> I, I just want to make it really clear, and I hope that people you know, read the book and they don't come away thinking that I'm trying to you know, minimize the importance of talents because, uh, talent, because obviously that is the biggest part of the equation here. And you can't, you know, this isn't like, um, you know, in some ways with Moneyball, it was like, um, you know, they were, it was a matter of resources. And they, and they really just couldn't go out and you know, get the right kind of talent. So, the way that they were going to, you know, the, the market inefficiency they were going to try to exploit was, you know, you know, try to get guys that were undervalued and could get on base and all these sorts of things. And, and these, aren't, uh, these aren't problems. You know, the Warriors, they have, um, obviously, they have resources and they have been allowed to invest over the years. But for me, it's been about understanding, and this is why I basically spend the first couple of chapters of the book, you know, laying out sort of the, the more recent history and, and Steph's rookie year and what the ownership the previous ownership group was and just how bad the Warriors have been because I think you have to understand just how far, just how bad they were. I mean, just how truly, truly terrible they were. And, and I think that once you understand that, you understand not that just that they've gone from like some middling team to an elite team, but that they have gone from like a historically awful team <laughs> to, to a team that's literally doing things that we've never seen do before in the NBA. And so I think that if it were something like this, then I think talent would be, then I think it would be uh, something where you could look at the talent and say, oh, this is, this is more, more of the factor that, that is going to rule the day. But the idea that the gap is just so wide between where they were and where they are now, that there's just so much more that goes into that equation and that there is more complexity to it and there's so many other factors at play. And that it is, it is more nuanced than just saying it is a Steph or it is a Clay. So sure. I hope that's one of the big, I hope that's one of the takeaways. I think that it's, it's a common frustration of mine when I see people, you know, sort of take the argument in those directions because I'm like, no, 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 step back. 
you know, <laughs> it, read the book. You know, it, it's, it's, it's really just about so much more than that. Um, but, uh, but I understand people's tendency to go in that direction. I don't begrudge them in any way because I do think that that's a pretty common uh, misconception. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, I think we'll take some audience questions. So when I think of Moneyball, I think of, you know, Billy Bean finding ways to mm -hmm. find new players, you know, under undervalued and, right. and you know, generate wins that way. Um, but from the talk, you know, and what I anticipate in the book is that like beta ball, how you view it is more about than just using data mm -hmm. and to, you know, find new ways to, to generate wins and using data to help you win. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it's more of the, the ethos of the, of the organization right. as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, and with, with the beta ball, I mean, the money ball piece, it seems like over the years, that competitive edge has sort of disappeared mm -hmm. a lot because everyone started doing it. Right. So are there elements that you find that are maybe slowly disappearing through, you know, those, those yeah. you know, methods that are disappearing? And what are maybe some of the things that are unique to the Golden State Warriors that are going to be very hard to replicate across all the teams? Yeah, the I, I think it's, um, I think what you're seeing is that in terms of, uh, I, I would say in terms of data-driven analytics, I think those are the sorts of uh, places where we've seen the playing field level. I think it's been, uh, easier for teams to sort of catch up along those lines. Um, I think it's going to be it's going to be in sort of the areas that are uh, a little bit more parallel to sports. It, it's going to yeah I brought up before about you know monitoring player sleep patterns and things like that. I mean it's going to be the things that uh, a lot of teams would look at and say um, you know maybe they're not willing to sort of go that extra mile or to sort of look at that aspect of sports or to understand how does this actually work. How can we apply this, uh, practically speaking, in a basketball sense? Uh, those are the places that the Warriors are starting to look at. And it's also things like, it's, it's things like virtual reality and things like that. And it's about trying to understand, are there, um, you know, are there ways to, to play basketball that are more efficient? Are there you know, concepts? You know, it's about, you know, are there ways that we can improve our practice and training regimen? And is that going to help our team excel in some way that perhaps other teams aren't? And I think that they, and I think, just think that they really sort of value their geography. I think that it would be really easy for some organization to sort of be here and say that, uh, you know, we're gonna do things our way or we're gonna keep things proprietary, that sort of thing. Uh, but they don't look at it that as competition. I mean, they, they really look at it as collaboration. And so that's why I think they like to work with a lot of these third parties and, and you know, they don't uh, expect that any of these partnerships are gonna necessarily change uh, the, the moon and the stars. but. They understand that uh, if there are ways that they can sort of incrementally get better, uh, then they're going to do that. And, and at this point, all the time, it's you know, there's there's not um, they don't really have a lot more room to improve at this point, which in some ways makes the equation a little bit harder. Not not about motivation, but practically speaking, how much better can you get? You know, you've had a team that won 73 games. Are they going to go 74 wins now? I mean, I don't think anyone really expects them to do that. I don't think that they look at it. I think they've stopped looking at basketball sort of in a micro sense and sort of how can we change this little thing and that little thing. I, I think that they're looking at in a more long-term macro sense and understanding that um, you know, their place in basketball history, their, you know, the, the discussion of the all-time great teams, their, their place in that discussion is, um, it is still unwritten. I mean, we don't know what the ending is for this, this franchise and this organization. And I think they, they're understanding that a lot of this can come crashing down pretty quickly. I think these things uh, sort of always rise up faster than we think, and they, always, they can kind of end faster than we think. Um, even though we feel like the Warriors have been good for so long, they've only been elite for three years. Mm -hmm. and they've only made the playoffs. You look at a team like the Spurs, you know, been, you know, made the playoffs 20 years in a row, was 18 straight years of 50 wins or more. The Warriors, have only, they're only, their playoff streak at the moment is only five years. Mm -hmm. So this thing is pretty ephemeral. Uh, but at the same time, these things can, can burn fast and they can burn, burn, they can burn out pretty quickly. So I think they understand that in some ways it really is up to them what, what direction this goes. Are they going to be a team like the Spurs? Are they going to be a team that, you know, are they going to turn over their roster? Is, is that going to be how they hold their advantage now? Is it going to be a Spursian kind of, well, we're just going to be consistently excellent and we're going to have a puncher's chance every year of winning a championship or do they or do they go like full Jordan era Bulls, where they try to win, you know, six titles in eight years or whatever it was, and they, you know, now you look at the Bulls, they're probably the worst team in the NBA talent-wise, but mm -hmm. 
but you know they, they had their run of success. They had their impact on the NBA, and, and no one's ever going to take that away from them. Um, but what do they want to be? Do they want to be the team that, that burns fast and burns out, or do they want to create something that is, that is more lasting? I, I think at this point in time, you already guessed, they're, they're trying to do the latter. You know, they're trying to be more of that Spursian kind of model. Um, but like I said, things can change so quickly in the NBA. We, sometimes we don't know where that next innovation is going to come from. I think that they think and they hope that they're going to be the ones to embrace that, whatever it might be. Um, but these, these things can be unexpected. So you just never know sometimes. Are you bullish? I am bullish. I think that, uh, I think that you can't help but sort of look at what they've done you know, these last three to five years and, and seven years since the owners have come in. But to look at them and say that it's clear that uh, there's more at play here than just getting in talented guys, that there is an effect that the front office and the coaching staff has, um, that they have an important role to play, and that as long as you keep, uh, if not those same people in, in, in power and making decisions, but you know, similar people that, that just embrace that sort of mindset and that philosophy, you know, maybe it's not a guy like Steve Kerr, but it's one of his disciples, or it's some part of the Steve Kerr coaching tree. Or, you know, we just saw, you know, Jerry West, you know, left this summer. He left, and now he's gone to the, the LA Clippers to be an advisor for them. And now you're going to see other guys. That, you know, Kirk Lacob is going to have a, a larger role to say in the, in the organization. You're going to see a guy like Larry Harris, who, you know, is not maybe sort of a household name to a lot of these guys, but he's going to have a bigger role to play now. And he's been a guy that's been around a few years. So um, you, you're going to have, now you're going to start to see as, as success you know, breeds, you know, more defections and people want a piece of what the Warriors have and they start, mm -hmm. you know, like I said, Travis Schlenk, who, you know, has been the Warriors for 13 years. Now he's the general manager of the Atlanta Hawks. Now, you know, now that he's trying to, to change them in a way that he's learned, not only under this ownership, but he was a holdover from the previous ownership. So this is a guy who knows not what to do, do but also what not to do. Um, but you're going to have these guys start to impart these lessons across the NBA. And so the onus is going to be on the Warriors to bring in to keep that going to bring in guys that understand that to you know keep you know creating the next generation of nba executives and i think in some ways that's easy, a lot easier said than done so but uh based on their most recent track record it's it's hard to bet against them well thank you mr malinowski let's give him one more round of applause